Welcome back to On The Move with Victor Xi. It is Thursday, February 9th, and today we're going to talk about how Republicans are able to use and craft language in a way that erodes at the very heart of democracy. How do they do it, and what can we do to push back against it? I'm grateful to be joined by Jennifer Murchia, who is a professor of communications at Texas A&M University and spends a lot of her time looking at how politicians use rhetoric and has looked specifically at how Donald Trump's use of rhetoric. Um, Jennifer and I are also writers together at Resolute Square, where she has a great newsletter called Rhetorical Tricks. I urge all of you to check it out. I literally learn from it every single time she writes. So Jennifer, it's so great to see you. Thanks so much for joining. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. So I'm so fascinated by this topic. And as someone who spends a lot of time looking at the news and is interested in communications, I, I want to get your take on how Republicans craft their message and rhetoric to their audience and why you think it works. Well, they're really good at um, using outrage bait. They're really good at using fear appeals. We know, and we've known for a really long time, that fear appeals work. Um, they work on our psychology. Um, they're really good at um, essentially taking what makes us human. So our cognitive weaknesses, our emotional weaknesses, and our social weaknesses and turning them against us. Hmm. Um, and so they're able to control the public sphere through some really anti-democratic and uh, duplicitous strategies. So an example of how, to me at least, how effectively Republicans use rhetoric and how it lands on people are terms like critical race theory and I don't know, even like make America great again. Can you explain how maybe these short phrases are able to tap into something deep within people and evoke a sense of either fear and critical race theory or in the other case, maybe a longing for something better or um, different? Yeah, both of those phrases are what uh, political communication scholars would call condensation symbols. Uh, meaning that they're in a way empty phrases, phrases that can mean just about anything to anyone. Mm, yeah. um, and what the Republicans do is they work very hard um, and they're very consistent, of course, across time and platforms um, and, and different media spaces to make those phrases very meaningful and in a very negative way, if that suits their needs or in a very positive way, if that suits their needs. Um, and so they use, you know, typical framing strategies, which is um, a way to not only tell you what to think about, right? So we want you to think about critical race theory, um, this thing that we call critical race theory, but also to think about them in a certain way. So they, they mm -hmm. use strategies like repetition, they use strategies like um, defining terms, um, using devil terms, which is making certain people into hate objects. Um, they use all of those strategies to get their audience to connect those ideas with very specific, um, you know, negative or positive things. And, and they're really successful at it. That's really interesting. So, and, and there also seems to be embedded within a lot of their rhetoric, and correct me if I'm wrong, that Republicans used to you know, like an us versus them narrative. Do you think that's a central way that Republicans are able to kind of craft their message? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it's such a great observation. So to me, the main sort of major premise of American politics over the last 30 years, um, especially from the Republican side, is that politics is war and the enemy cheats. Hmm. When politics is war, that means we should and can do anything to win. Um, and when the enemy, you know, isn't just good people who have different opinions from us, you know, the opposition, the loyal opposition sometimes, um, you know, but if they're enemies and they cheat, then that means you can never trust them. You should never negotiate with them. Yeah. You know, it's always going to be this Mankean struggle, us versus them. Um, it's incredibly polarizing and it's it's designed to do that. Right. Um and so that's been the major premise. It's what I think of as the really big lie um, that has sort of defined our politics for a really long time. Um, and, and it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> yeah. I mean, honestly, if you think about it carefully, it doesn't make any sense. Just because somebody has a different political policy preference, you know, doesn't mean that they're a bad person. Um, you know, I live in a place where there's a lot of Republicans and I have a lot of good friends and neighbors, my students, um, colleagues who have different policy preferences from me, doesn't make them bad people. Um, but that's how it's positioned in the discourse. And it's really anti-democratic. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I want to ask you about that because I, I read a recent piece that you wrote for Resolute Square about conspiracy theories and how it's a lucrative and successful media and politics strategy. But putting that strategy aside, I mean, help us understand more about this and, and why do you think people believe in conspiracies? Is it, is it because of a lack of education or ability or critically, you know, critical thinking skills or is anyone susceptible to this? Yeah, we would like to think that it's because they're uneducated or they lack skills, um, but it's not true. In fact, um, the highly educated are just as likely or even more likely to believe in conspiracy mm. theories as the uneducated or less educated. Um, it is one of the vulnerabilities. Like I said, they exploit our vulnerabilities and um, and conspiracy theory in particular thrives in environments that um, are very distrusting. And we have historic levels of distrust in this country yeah, um, yeah. for one another, for institutions, for established leaders. It was one of the things that Donald Trump uh, read you know, correctly into the situation of the 2016 campaign. And his whole campaign was designed to increase distrust um, and to yeah. tell his audience, you know, trust no one but me. That is a very fertile environment for conspiracy theory. Um, and conspiracy theory is so fascinating to me because it's what I think of as a self-sealing narrative, meaning that evidence is not allowed to puncture the narrative. If you say, you know, that didn't happen or, um, you know, experts say or the authorities say, they say, well, they lie or they won't tell you the truth or they cheat. Right. And so it covers up any possible hole that you could puncture in the narrative, yeah. which means that if you're able to wield conspiracy, you can point the finger at anyone you want um, and it puts you in a position of power, hmm. but it also puts your audience members in a position of power because now they can do their own research. They can investigate and they can discover the truth. They're not stooges, hmm. right? They're you know powerful themselves because they know what's really going on. Um, so it really plays off of cynicism and distrust. It counts on audiences being what Hannah Arendt said as gullible and cynical, um, right. that they believe everything that you tell them and nothing that the other side says. Um, and it's really pernicious because people will always believe those conspiracies. They can never be disproven. So as I hear you talk about this, I mean, I've heard so much about kind of the, the term that I guess is used by, or to, that the term that people kind of try to describe what Republicans are doing. I mean, I've heard misinformation, disinformation, lies, propaganda. I personally like conspiracy a lot. But what do you think? Is there a catch all term that can describe what Republicans are doing, or is it um, kind of depends on what they're saying? Yeah, I think of it as using communication as a weapon. Um, mm. It's information warfare. And information warfare is all of those things, right? Disinformation, misinformation, yeah. conspiracy, rhetorical tricks. Um, and, you know, the info wars are ongoing. And anytime yeah. you're on the internet, anytime you read a newspaper or listen to the news, you know, the info, you're a part of the info wars. Um, whether you realize it or not, whether you think you're fighting them or not, uh, we all are. That's the, the communication environment that we're in right now. So can you think of an antidote to what you described? I mean, it was alarming to hear you talk about how educated people, too, are just as, if not more, susceptible to falling prey to conspiracy theories and, and misinformation and, and lies. Is there some sort of thing that we can do to counter that? Or is that it kind of up to you know, the media to do it? What, what's, what's a possible solution to that? Yeah. So um, I wish I could tell you that there's a magic solution um, and, and it's not because critical theory or not critical theory, but um, critical thinking is also a propaganda strategy. Right. So you might say, oh, well, we just teach critical thinking to everyone. Um, but that's exactly what QAnon uses. That's exactly what Infowars uses. Right. They say, you know, do your own research. You know, these are the, the good sources that you should trust. You know, these are the, the ones that are trying to mislead you. They use the same strategies. Uh, Dana Boyd is a researcher who pointed this out, and um, she's absolutely right. Um, you know, so there isn't just a magic solution. Um, the real solution is to rebuild trust. And it's a long term solution, mm, right? To yeah, rebuild yeah. trust, to, to make it so that people aren't so cynical um, and that they're not so polarized and distrusting, because that's how you build democracy. Um, you can't have a well functioning political community without trust. You know, we mm -hmm. just, you can't. 
And so, you know, the major problem um, is, is behind all of these strategies. And these strategies thrive in this environment where you have this distrust and frustration. Um, and so those strategies also encourage more distrust and frustration. Uh, so that, you know, when we talk about doing democracy, we're talking about communicating for democracy, associating, thinking for democracy, like orienting our lives towards um, rebuilding and building bridges yeah. between different groups. It's a constant endeavor. And, I, and I've asked you a lot about Republicans, but I'm wondering what you think about how Democrats use language and if there's anything you think Democrats can be doing more effectively in reaching their audience. Yeah. So a lot of people would like to see Democrats like fight the information wars too and engage in outrage bait and, you know, stunts yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, during the State of the Union and, you know, things like that. Um, <laughs> and I, I am not on that side of that mm -hmm. um, question. I think that you have to have grownups in the room. You have to have people mm -hmm. who earnestly believe in democracy and believe in democratic communication and believe in good faith argument and trying to persuade rather than manipulate. Sure. Um, yeah. Those are democratic strategies. You can't save democracy by perverting democracy. Um, and so, you know, they have to do the hard work and they're doing it. And, you know, obviously they're doing it pretty well because they're convincing a lot of people to vote for them. They've won the last, well, all the last elections, um, <laughs> including 2016, really, yeah, uh, yeah. because they won the popular vote. Um, you know, and so I, I really think that the democratic message is the message of the future. I think that they're the party of the future. And I think that they're doing a good job of explaining what their values are, what their policies are, and why they think that we should move forward in the way that we should. Um, that, but they're that, not winning, that, you know, the information yeah. wars. <laughs> that, that's something that I grapple with, I mean, every single day. Maybe it's because I... And on Twitter, and Twitter isn't representative of the world, but there seems to be this this debate between people and, and how Democrats should respond. Should they respond like Michelle Obama um, once said, when they go low, we go high? Or is it that we get down at the same level and, and fight fire with fire? And, you know, I, the better of me tends to think that Michelle Obama is right. But I, I'm curious to hear kind of your yeah. thoughts as an expert about, you know, yeah. why, why that's the case. And, and I, I think I agree with you that, you know, we need someone in the room who actually believes in democracy and who will actually stand up for what's, what's right and not kind of get on their level. We do. Um, and I, as Michelle Obama said that, and she was right to say that, but also the Obama administration was really good at communication. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so um, they were fantastic at harnessing new media technologies and using them to their advantage. They had a very different strategy than we have seen over the last, um, well, since Trump started in 2015. Yeah. You know, they really wanted to use social media in a positive way. They thought that if they posted a lot of positive information, made information available about their policies, that, you know, the large number of followers they had would feel proud and they would want to circulate and amplify that information. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and attend to it. And that they were right. I mean, that's exactly what happened. But when Donald Trump came around in 2015, the whole communication environment, um, like I said, turned into the information warfare strategy. Um, and, you know, that strategy was the strategy of white nationalists. That strategy yeah, was the yeah. strategy of, um, you know, agent provocateurs <laughs> like Roger Stone um, and, and of course, information warriors like Alex Jones. Um, and those people have remade, you know, political discourse. And, and on that side of the aisle, um, you know, the political discourse isn't about trying to persuade people that your policies are best. It's trying to force compliance. It's trying to win the day and control the discourse rather than persuade people. Um, wow. Democrats are into persuading people. They're not into trying to coerce, um, you know, the nation. And, and like I said, it works for them because the policies that they support are also the policies that a majority of the nation supports, you know. And so the party should represent what the nation wants. Um, and I mean, the Republicans are 
are a losing party. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and so they communicate like losers. Yeah, <laughs> that's so true. That. So I have one <laughs> final question for you. I mean, and, and you're exactly right, though. They, I mean, they, they are losing their, their base by the day because it's an increasingly white and older demographic. And I hope they realize that before it's too late. But I have, I have one final question for you, which is, I mean, what do you think is something that every American and people watching this should know about rhetoric and how to detect things that Republicans are trying to do? Yeah, um, you know, it, it can be really uh, disillusioning. It can be a big bummer to start to really learn about how information warfare works and how um, easily it is to manipulate others and how, um, you know, a lot of people uh, know how to, to do it and, and actually actively are trying to do it every day. Uh, yeah. Um, it can be really demoralizing and my students are bummed about it, frankly. Um, so I, I'm a little bit practiced in, in trying to give a cheer up talk about it. <laughs> um, mainly I would say pay attention to your feelings. So if you go to therapy or you learn anything about therapy, they always say, feel your feelings, right? Like mm -hmm. your body is telling you, um, cause it, a lot of, uh, stress manifests, you know, in your body. So feel your feelings, feel how you're feeling. Um, and I would say the same thing is true of manipulation. You know, if you're being manipulated, um, your body will tell you if you, if you think about, you know, is my heart racing because of this news that I'm watching, the news should not make your heart race, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right? The news should not make you feel outraged. I mean, outrageous things happen in the news, of course, so, you know. Um, but it shouldn't make you feel that way. It, it shouldn't be doing that. And so I think um, one way is to be a high self-monitor. So mm -hmm. monitor your own communication, how you're communicating with the world, um, whether you're doing that for democracy or not. Be open to people who have different opinions from you. They're not evil. They're not enemies. They just think differently. Um, and, and pay attention to how you're feeling. That is great advice. And I urge everyone also to check out your book, Demagogue for President, the uh, rhetorical genius of Donald Trump, as well as your newsletter, Rhetorical Tricks on uh, on Resolute Square. Uh, Jennifer, thanks so much for joining us. And it was so wonderful to have you here. That was my pleasure. Thank you. Of course. Thank you so much. Okay, so we have some news of the day that we want to get into before uh, I let you go for your Thursday. The first is um, yesterday, uh, Joe Biden, right after his State of the Union, went on the road. He was in Wisconsin. And one of the things that I was comforted by and, and thought that he should do more of is call out Republicans by name. And yesterday he called out re Republicans like Rick Scott and Ron Johnson, both of whom from the state of Wisconsin, for their previous stances on Social Security and Medicare. And they and basically President Biden was on stage and had the literal uh, document with him that said that uh, Rick Scott and Ron Johnson were on record saying they want to slash Social, Social Security and Medicare. And so um, that was an important moment, I thought. And as he goes around the country, I hope he has more of these records and makes it clear to the American people that these are who Republicans are. This is what Republicans have said. And we shouldn't trust that it was simply a mistake. They were intentional about it. They have provisions in legislation that would require all federal programs to sunset, basically, that includes Medicare and Social Security. Security, and unless the federal government reauthorizes them. And so um, I, I think what President Biden is doing is, is really good. He's channeling the, the dark Brandon within him. And just this morning as well, uh, Rick Scott was on CNN with Caitlin Collins. And if you have, if you all haven't watched that interview, you definitely should. I linked it to my Twitter page. Um, basically, Caitlin Collins pressed him about whether or not he uh, made a mistake when he included that legislation that would require federal programs like Social Security and Medicare to sunset. And Rick Scott said that it was not a mistake. He was intentional about it. And so, you know, these are what Republicans are saying to us uh, on the media um, and, and, and on social media platforms. And it's on all of us to listen and to really make sense and, and, and kind of acknowledge what they're what they're telling us, because what they're telling us is clear as day. And I think it requires all of us to not only kind of acknowledge that and believe in them, but also to act on it in 2024 by voting these people out. Um, some other news. Uh, last night or yesterday throughout the day, Twitter was down. I uh, personally couldn't tweet uh, for some time. I couldn't follow people. It was a really strange thing. And it was just kind of another indication that this platform is slowly dying. It seems like um, just day by day, th the Twitter that we once used to know isn't the same. And 
you know, in large part because of Elon Musk. And so yesterday that was a really strange situation. I know recently I've been seeing more alt-right Republicans on my Twitter page, which I do not follow at all. Um, but it's a, it's this kind of slow disintegration of Twitter, and it's unfortunate. Yesterday we saw that yet again, and I was talking to some friends, they couldn't post, um, they couldn't like, they couldn't retweet, they couldn't comment. Um, so it was just all around a really concerning thing. So for those of you who don't follow me on Twitter, you can follow me on Instagram or uh, Post or even Mastodon, I guess. We, we all have so many social media platforms. And today actually is uh, the first day that Spoutable, which is uh, Chris Buzzi's platform who we had on this show uh, earlier on uh, in January, um, Spoutable will be going live for the general public today at 8 p.m. Eastern time. So if you want an alternative to Twitter, you can also go to Spoutable and sign up there. So that is all the news that I have for you today. Um, I'll be back tomorrow at 8 a.m. Pacific time, 11 a.m. Eastern time, right here on youtube.com slash Politicon. We'll be joined by the wonderful Molly Jong Fast to talk about the news of the week. You do not want to miss that. Uh, it'll be a great episode, and I will be back uh, every day after that uh, at 8 a.m. Pacific time, 11 a.m. Eastern time, right here on youtube.com slash Politicon. You do not want to miss it, um, and I will see you all tomorrow. Have a great rest of your Thursday.